So we have tonight. Good evening. So tonight we have we have um, two Thursday nights tonight and next week. So we're gonna do it for for Rosh Hashanah, and then uh, we have Thursday night. We have next week again for the new year tonight and next week, and then we have the week after we can do for uh, Yom Kippur, and then we have the next Thursday. We don't miss any. Don't have to miss any Thursdays this year, so it all works out very well. Um, what I want to do tonight with you is, on the main, is to uh, learn, we'll, we'll use the text, we'll use the Rambam from his Mishnah Torah. Where the Rambam in his Mishnah Torah has three chapters on the laws of Rosh Hashanah. So we're not going to do all the three chapters, we're going to skip, jump through it. Um, and then we'll see what other matters arise while we are discussing all that. Okay. Let me just... Right. Okay, so let's uh, share the screen here. Boom, boom. Here we go. Do you see the Rambam? Did it change screen? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Let me just. And you're able to see everybody else. Yes. Good. Yes. Yeah. See f- five people. Oh, fantastic! How many have we got on tonight? Seven. Seven. Very good. That's right. Stands on as well. Okay. So this is from the Ramam's Mishnah Torah. Let me make my little window here down sideways. There you go. So this is taken from the Mishnah Torah. He has one section. It's called Hilches, Sheva, Lulav, and Sukkah, and Lulav. And um, the, like I said, the first three chapters is laws of, of uh, Sheva. The whole thing together is eight chapters. Okay. So there's three on on Shaifer, then four, five, and six is on Lula and Sukkah, and then six and seven and eight are on the laws of Lulav. So we'll do tonight the uh, laws of Shaifer. So he starts it off as he normally does. Three commandments in this section to listen to the sounding of the Shaifer on the first day of Tishrei, to dwell in the Sukkah throughout the seven days of Sukkot to take a lulav in the Beis Amigdash throughout the seven days of the festival of Sukkot. You're probably wondering, has he not missed out Yom Kippur? So Yom Kippur, he already did. There was a whole section just on the laws, on the laws of Yom Kippur, which is previously in the Mishnah Torah. So the other two remaining festivals is, is uh, the, the other two remaining biblical mitzvahs is Sukkot and, uh, and Rosh Hashanah. So Rosh Hashanah has one mitzvah and Sukkot has two mitzvahs. Okay. Now, just the, uh, just to this part over here, the first mitzvah is it's significant. The first mitzvah is to listen to the sounding of the shofar, not to blow the shofar. The mitzvah is to listen, to hear the shofar. That, that's very important because if the mitzvah was to blow the shofar, then every one of us would have to blow our own shofar. That's why the bracha that said before Blowing shofar is Asher Kedishan Baruch Atah Hashem Lekenu Baruch Alam Asher Kedishan Mitzvah Vetzivanu Lishmoa Kol Shofar to hear the sound of the shofar because the mitzvah is to listen. If you can blow, then very good. But the mitzvah is to listen. Now this, as we'll see later on, has ramifications because somebody who cannot hear, a deaf person, someone who cannot hear, is not obligated in the mitzvah, and if he's not obligated in the mitzvah, he cannot perform the mitzvah for others. You understand? The only one who can perform a mitzvah for others is someone who himself is obligated. So a deaf person is not obligated because he can't hear. While if the mitzvah was to blow, then a deaf person would be able to do the mitzvah. You understand? So that's uh, significant in the halacha, as we'll see later. So the Ramam starts number one. It's a positive mitzvah, a positive commandment from the Torah to hear the sounding of the shofar and Rosh Hashanah. As it's written in Chumash, it shall be a day of sounding to you. Yom Trua. Yom Trua, we have it in the Davin. It shall be a day of Trua, which we know to mean, the word Trua means to sound, for you. And we know it's a ram's horn. What exactly is a Trua? What type of sound? We don't know. And that we're going to soon see. Okay, the Chumash doesn't tell us. So the Ramam continues that the shofar, which is sounded both on Rosh Hashanah and the other biblical mitzvah of blowing the shofar, is on the Yovel. The Yovel is the Jubilee year, the year 50. In the year 50, 
In other words, the Jewish calendar works seven years is Shemitah, and then seven times seven, so you have seven Shemitah, seven sabbatical years. And then you had another year of, of rest, which is year 50, year 49, and then year 50. And one of the things that happened in year 50 was that the ancestral land went back to the original owners, and slaves were freed. When were they freed? When the shofar was blown in the Yovel on Yom Kippur. We blow shefer in Yom Kippur today. That's a custom. At the end of Yom Kippur, we blow shefer. That's not the shefer that we're talking about here. Here we're talking about the Yovel. So there's two mitzvahs to blow the shefer. Good evening. Mm-hmm. It's a blow the shefer in Rosh Hashanah every year. And the mitzvah of Yovel. The mitzvah is a bent ram's horn. Specifically, not straight, but bent. Not straight, but bent, like that. All shofret other than of a ram are unacceptable. So the Rambam tells us very clearly, it has to be a ram's horn. Um, Halacha does not follow the Rambam, because you can use a sheep's horn, a goat, these type of things, but it, it doesn't have to be specifically from a ram. Even though the sounding of the shofar and Rashan is not explicitly mentioned in the Torah, but it is derived by our sages in the following manner. It says, and concerning the Yovel, it says you shall make a proclamation sounding the shofar, you shall proclaim with the shofar. So the shofar is that announcement that needs to the proclamation of Yovel to say that the slaves can go free and various other things that happen. So the shofar, from there we learn that the blowing of the shofar is a proclamation. And therefore, the oral tradition explains that just as the sounding required by the Torah and the Yovel requires a shofar, so to the sounding that it's uh, the Rosh Hashanah requires a shofar. Because you remember here in this verse, all it says is it shall be a day of blowing, a day of sounding. It doesn't say what. So we learn it from the verse in Leviticus. Over there, it's, which is earlier than this one. All right? So this is one of the 13 methods of Torah interpretation that we mention every so often. You're right that you have it in the Siddur at the beginning of Davening or Yishmael Omer. Right, and because in Leviticus 25 9 it also speaks about blowing and it says clearly that it's done with the shofar, so then we know for this one that it's also talking about the shofar. The Torah doesn't have to get say repeat that word again, okay? That's what we've discussed many times. We learned it at length the method, the 13 methods of Torah interpretation. Rami, can you explain again uh, why you can or cannot use a goat's horn? It says here, all, all shofar other than that of a ram are unacceptable. Right. So I said, as far as I know, the halacha does not follow the Rambam. And you could use other animals except from a cow. But you can use, the, the halacha is that you can use the horn of an animal as long as the, the horn is hollow inside. What that means is, this is the part of the horn which is on the head, right? Yeah. And inside, this is hard. This part is hard. Inside is a soft cartilage. So what they do is, when, when they cut it off the animal's head, obviously after the animal has died, you can't remove a horn when the animal is alive. I don't think you can. So afterwards, what they do is they have to boil it. They have to cook it. It's a very smelly business. Yeah, yeah. And then the, the, the cartilage inside slips out. And then they cut off this end, they make a hole, and you have a shofar. Yeah. The horn of an ox or a cow is not like that. It's not. It's called a karen, not a shofar, because it's all one piece. There's no cartilage inside that you can remove. So if you'd want to take the horn of a cow and 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 make it into a shofar, you'd have to drill and hollow it out. That's not valid for a shofar. Okay. Thank you. Okay. But according to the Rambam, it's only the horn of a ram. Okay. Okay. Now, in temple times, number two, in the Beis HaMikdash, on Rosh Hashanah, they would blow the shofar in the following manner. There was one shofar, and there were two trumpets. Okay, now, if I refer you back, if you remember from Parshas Baha Leischa, we read it back in June, okay, two weeks after Shavuos. Parshas Baha Leischa, the Chumash instructs us of the various trumpet laws. that They had to be, God instructs Moses that they have to make silver out of the shekel, half shekels that they received, that was raised, they made silver trumpets. And the silver trumpets were blown on various occasions, like when they were moving, or on Yom, Yom Tev, or when the, some of the offerings, the carbonis were brought. So in the Beis Hamikdash, they would blow the shofar like this. There was one shofar and two trumpets, one on either side. 
So in other words, there would have been whoever it was, the Levim or the whoever was blowing, I don't know. Three of them. In the middle stood the one with the shofar, and on either side stood the one with the trumpet. The sounding of the shofar was extended while that of the trumpets was shortened. So they would start blowing together. So I don't mean think it means that they're blowing together. What it means is there was a trumpet blast, and then there was a longer shofar blow, and then there was another trumpet blast. Because the mitzvah of the day is performed with the shofar. So the trumpet blasts were there as an intro and as an afterwards. And then the main the main part of the show was the actual shofar itself. Why were the trumpets sounded together with it? Because we have a verse in Tehillim that says, you shall sound trumpets in the voice of the shofar before God, the king. That's the way it was done in the Beis Hamikdash because that's when they stood before God. Literally. However, in other places, outside of the Beis Hamikdash, outside of the temple on Rosh Hashanah, only the shofar is blown. Not the trumpets, as we as we know it. Okay. Um, let's go to number four. Now, regarding the shofar to be used on Rosh Hashanah, it's for, this is relevant for this year. It is forbidden to violate the festival laws to obtain it. Soon we'll see the relevance to this year. So in other words, you can't violate Yom Tiv. I forgot I don't have a shofar, so I'll take a car to Manchester and I'll buy a shofar, even though the shofar store is closed on Rosh Hashanah, right? Or I will slaughter a ram and 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 get the uh, the shofar off its head, so I should be able to blow it on Yom Tov. You, know, you can't do that. You can't violate the Yom Tov to obtain a shofar. This applies even when the forbidden practice is in the category of a shvus. A shvus is the Rambam already taught earlier the laws of Shabbos that a shavuos is a rabbinic prohibition of Shabbos, as opposed to a biblical prohibition. So even if it involves the transgression of a rabbinic prohibition, we don't say, well, shofar is so important and it overrides. No, we don't. For example, here's an example. If there's a shofar in a treetop or across the river, and that's the only shofar that's available, you're not allowed to climb the tree or swim across the water to bring it. That's because those are two activities that are forbidden on Shabbos and Yom Tev. Needless to say, we may not cut the shofar from the animal's head or perform a forbidden labor to prepare a shofar so that we may blow it. The reason, the rationale for the above is blowing the shofar fulfills a positive mitzvah, while the observance of Yom Tiv fulfills a positive and a negative. Because earlier the Rambam told us that Yom Tiv has two mitzvahs, the mitzvah of keeping Yom Tiv and the mitzvah of not desecrating Yom Tiv. While shofar is just the positive mitzvah of blowing shofar, so you can't, it doesn't override the two mitzvahs of Yom Tiv. The observance of a positive commandment does not negate the observance of both a positive and a negative commandment. Okay. However, if you have a shofar that's not yet ready, you you know that you know how you, have you ever seen how a shofar is made? No. Uh, today they're all very nice and they look they actually look like plastic. This outside is made, it's the same material as our fingernails. Okay? It's just much thicker, but it's like the same material as a fingernail. But it's a very smelly and messy job, let me tell you. I did it many years ago with a chauffeur factory. Um, we, 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 we were in a school in Teaneck, New Jersey, 1987. <laughs> Anyways, um, you got to then make the hole, and then you want to clean it out with vinegar to get the schmeck away and all that. That's what he's talking about over here. So if you have a chauffeur that's not yet ready, it's permitted to rinse a chauffeur with water, wine, or vinegar in order to improve its color. <laughs> However, as an expression of deference, one should never use urine for that purpose, lest one view the mitzvahs in a de- 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 depreciating manner. In other words, we're looking for various liquids that may help it, and urine could be something that helps to clean out the shofar, the acidity and so on, but it's disrespectful. That's why it's not used. Okay. How big or how small can a shofar be? You see, today you have the big, long shafers. They come from a kudu, right? So that's what I was saying before, that the, the halacha doesn't follow the view of the Rambam. Um, What's in a kudu? Everything that the Rambam wrote, do we follow, does the halacha actually follow? What's in a kudu? A kudu. A kudu. It's a type of antelope. It's a, sorry? It's a, it's, a, it's a type of antelope. Yeah, you can oh, get it in from Africa. Mm, thank you. Um, so people want to show up when they're blowing shofar. 
Yeah, with very long, straight, curly uh, horns. <clears throat> just type in this Google Shofar, you'll see the long ones, those are from Kudus. Are they easier to blow? Um, I try, no, I didn't find them easier. They have a very deep sound to them. Mm. They're not easier to blow, not the ones that I've uh, tried. And you wonder how strong that kudu's head must be because they're quite heavy and he wears two of them on his head. Okay, so number five, the minimum size of a shafer is a measure sufficient that one may hold the shafer in one's hands with the ends visibly protruding on either side. So the shortest it can be is up to here. So I can cut this over here and it's still a kosher shafer because it's protruding here and I can have a little bit protruding here and that's a kosher shafer. Now, um, it wouldn't be practically, practically it would be difficult to blow the shorter it is. Um, such a short shafer. It also depends on the shape. But there are certain circumstances throughout our history where people would have to conceal the shofar and hide it. So they would have to have a very small shofar. It, it doesn't say uh, in a hand. It said in one's hands, as if to say she'd be holding it two-handed. In one's hands, you mean? Yes, we've oh. put it. Plural. The original. Very good. Okay, that's a okay, that's a mis okay, it should be in one's hand. In Very the good. original, the Rama says the Xena be Yada in one's hand. And you're right. Very Change good. Yeah, yeah. Good Stan. It's one's hand. And uh, the commenter has explained whose hand? An average person. Not a giant and not a midget. Right? It should be in the hand of an average person. So the uh, Gemara says, the Rambam doesn't give a measurement. The Gemara gives a measurement of a tefach, which is a tefach, is, this is a tefach, about five inches. Now comes the practical laws which happen even today. As a shofar ages, <coughs> it, they can develop cracks, especially if they drop on the floor or something. Should a shofar be cracked lengthwise, that means anywhere in the length of the shofar, Anywhere, then it is unacceptable. It's possible. Should it be cracked along its width, or what you'd call perhaps the circumference? You know? If a measure equivalent to the minimum size of a shafer remains beneath it, so if it cracks, and after below the crack, there's enough for a shafer. Yeah? What are we up to? Um, if a measurement equivalent to the size of a shefer remains, then it is kosher. It's considered as if it was cut off at the place of the crack. You don't even have to cut it. It's considered, if the crack is here, and my shefer is kosher here, but the crack is here, so fine, that's okay. Because I have a kosher shefer. So that's like the end of the shefer ends there. It's as if it's not there. What about if a shefer has a hole in it? So, if it was plugged with another substance, used, I don't know, cement, plastic, whatever it was, it's unacceptable. It's puzzle. If it was plugged with its own kind, it is kosher. Under the fire. Its own kind, somehow, you're able to weld together one shofar with another. And that way, you're able to cover the hole with another material from another shofar. So then it's okay under the following conditions, provided that the majority of the shofar remains whole. And also provided the plugging of the hole does not alter the sound from the way it was before the hole developed. Okay. Again, these are stuff that today it's really, these are, this is, you know, the halacha is like this. A shofar like this costs 25 pounds. So you know, people are not going to go and start welding and making a whole business out of it. If a shofar is possible, just go buy a new one. I was in the shop today. Someone asked me for a shofar I brought back to Liverpool. It's interesting. They have these for starting at 25 and they have up to 80 pounds. Not much bigger than this. But I, I'm, and I was wondering, how do they work out the difference in prices in the Schaefer? You know, it's not like, you know, it has a longer battery and has more gigabytes or something like that. How do they work out the price of a Schaefer? That's the mystery. It's probably the same mystery as how they work out the price for an Estrig. But even an Estrig, we can understand. <laughs> They're cleaner ones, straighter ones, the right shape. A Schaefer is a Schaefer, you know. The, even this shape, the shape that you see of a Schaefer is not the natural shape. When they start working on the shafer, it's under fire and in heat. They polish it, they buff it, they, they sandpaper it, they shape it, they shellac it, polish it, and they make a nice shape. 
I don't know if it's written here, but in Shulchan Aruch, he speaks that sometimes some shafers, some have the hidur, to the shafer should be, when, it's, when they're blowing, the shafer should be facing up. Others say it should be facing to the right. So they, 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 they can manipulate the shafer and twist and turn it as they want. So that's why I wonder how they, develop, how they work out the price. In any case, that's about a hole. If one merely perforated the inside of the horn, but not remove them, what does that mean? Ah, he perforated the inside. One second, what does that mean? I only did this last week. Ah, what he means is, so like I told you, there is that, um, what did I say it was called? The stuff that's in here? Cartilage. Oh, the cartilage that's inside. So he's saying over here is one perforated the inside of the horn. He perforated, he made a hole in the cartilage, but did not remove the inside. This cartilage, it is kosher because a substance of the same kind is not considered an intervening entity. Should one stick together fragments of the shafer until one has constructed a shafer, you know, the shards of a shafer, and put it back together again with crazy glue, that's unacceptable, that's puzzle. Okay. So he includes all the laws of cracks and, and, and holes and shards in one halacha number five. Now comes, let's say you have a nice, a, a good shafer, but you want to add, you want to make it look nice. If one made any addition to a shofar, whether of its kind or from another substance, is unacceptable. Um, you want to make it nice. You want to put a, you know, you want to add a mug in David. I've seen shofars where there's a mug in David engraved in it, which is, which is fine. But let's say you take from another shofar and you make a shape of a mug in David and then you glue it on. So he's saying that's not allowed. Whether it's, it comes from its kind or from another substance, it's unacceptable. Should oh, let me turn let me turn this off. There we go. Should one coat it with gold from the inside or the mouthpiece? You want to make it look fancy, so you'll have a gold uh, mouthpiece. Unacceptable. Puzzle. Should one coat it on the outside? So then it depends. If its sound is changed from what it was originally, it's not acceptable. If the sound did not change, then it's kosher. So on the outside, it already depends. So two things here. On the inside, you're not allowed to put anything. Even at the mouthpiece, you're not allowed to put anything. Because the mouthpiece, you have to be blowing into a shafer, not onto anything else. So you can't have, you know, uh, an extension to the mouth. You know, remember the old cigarettes used to have these fancy plastic things. Some smokers used to have to add an extra filter or something. You remember, You know what I'm talking about? You have something like that on this, for whatever reason, it's possible. However, if you want to put gold or anything else around here, then it depends if it affects the sound of the shofar. Right? Should one cut it with gold on the inside of the... Uh, uh, um, um, should one cut it on the outside? It's, uh, if, if its sound is changed from what it originally... It was originally, it's not accepted. It's possible. If its sound did not change, it's kosher. What happens if you put one shofar inside another one? You can get a small shofar and... Again, why would you do that? I have no idea. <laughs> but, the, the, you know, there are many laws that are there in the statute books, whether they're practical or not. But that's the way it is. I have no idea of the scenario why somebody would do that. But the Gemara speaks about it. You put one inside another. So if one hears the sound of the inner shofar, then fine, you fulfill your obligation. But if by blowing here, you're hearing the sound of the outer shofar, you're not fulfilling the obligation because there's something that's affecting the sound. There's something inside. Should one widen the narrow portion of the shofar and narrow its wider part? Puzzle. In other words, again, as I told you, in heat, this is very flexible. It becomes a very flexible piece of plastic. And you can then narrow this end and perhaps stretch this end and reverse the shofar. That is not an acceptable shofar. It's puzzle. So we're limited to what we can do. We can twist it and turn it. We can clean it and polish it, but we can't uh, manipulate it to turn it backwards. We can even... What they do is they make a they make a mouthpiece here to make it easier to blow. So it is stretched a bit, but it's not stretched like this. So they make it that should be a comfortable mouthpiece. If a shefer was long and one shortened it, as we said earlier, it's kosher. If one scraped away the horn, either from the inside or from the outside, even if one did not 
if one did, did so to the extent that all that remained was the thin external wall, it's kosher. So, in other words, you're scraping away at the horn to make, yeah, look, you see that has a certain thickness. So you want to make it thinner, whatever. It's okay. It's kosher. It doesn't have to be in its full natural state. That's what he's saying here. Then we go to echoes. He speaks about over here that you have to, the mitzvah is to hear the shofar. Remember, again, this is another relevant thing. We said earlier, the mitzvah is to hear the shofar. That means you have to hear the shofar, not an echo. If the mitzvah is to blow the shofar, then it's irrelevant if you hear an echo. But here he's telling us that if you hear, the, if you're glued in a pit or in a cave, those standing within the pit or the cave are yetzer, fulfilled obligation, but those on the outside, it depends. If they heard the sound of the shofar, they fulfilled. If they heard the sound of an echo, they did not fulfill the obligation. Right? Because the mitzvah is to hear, not to blow. Okay. That's chapter one. Um, where's the next? How do I get? It's under here. Oh, it's right over here. Okay. Chapter two. Well, could I just ask a question, Avrami, if I may? If one was to put not a, a physical loudspeaker, but uh, the same sort of horn shaped amplifier that they had on the old record players in front of a chauffeur that amplified the sound, would that be acceptable? The answer is no, and you know why. We just read it 30 seconds ago. It's an echo. It's not the sound of the chauffeur. It's the sound of the echo inside that large, large apparatus. You understand? Well, I, I think I'd have to look at the definition of an echo. <laughs> an echo, I'll tell you the definition. An echo means sound that bounces off of other uh, surfaces and you're hearing the sound as it bounces off okay. through the other surfaces. That's what an echo is. That's why when you're in a valley, you'll hear echo, echo. You'll hear it again because it keeps bouncing yeah. back all over. I think it's time for the chayim. <laughs> That's right. Oh, Ashley. Oh, right. I can't see everybody on the screen, so I didn't see you come in, Ashley. Good evening. Good evening. I didn't want to disturb you. We'll have a lachayim. It's always good to have a lachayim. I can open a new bottle today. Okay. Lachayim, lachayim. Hi. Okay. Let's see who we got here. Oh, Stan, I didn't see you. Good evening. I don't have all the all the pictures, all the faces on my screen because I have this page up. Okay. Now, chapter two, he comes to tell us who is obligated in the mitzvah. So, number one, everyone is obligated to hear the sound of the shofar. Kahanim, Levim, Yisraelim, Gerim, and even freed slaves. However, women, slaves, who are currently slaves, <coughs> and children, minors, are free, exempt from the obligation. Because they, <coughs> women and slaves, are exempt from mitzvahs that are time-based. Okay? And this is a mitzvah that's time-based, first of Tishrei. Therefore, they are exempt from those mitzvahs. <coughs> what about a person who is half-slave and half-free? For example, he was owned by two people. We're not doing now the laws of slavery, but in the laws of slavery, the Ramam describes that sometimes there are partners who own a slave. I think we did slavery a few months ago, to the, and we learned how slavery in the Torah is very, very... Yeah, we did, didn't we? We did it yeah. a few months ago. We discussed yeah, it. Yeah, we definitely did that. All right. <clears throat> and it's a very different concept of slavery than what we... What we uh, Rami, could, could I just, uh, for the purpose of interesting debate and halakha debate without being disrespectful, uh, an echo has uh, two components, which is what I thought. A, a, reflection of sound, but to be an echo, there must be a delay. Now, I would contend that if you put a, a sort of larger horn around it, uh, it goes wider at one end, there's no delay in the sound, and by definition, that's not an echo. But why would you want to do that? No, no, that's not, the, that's not the issue. That's not a good answer, Jeff. I'm sorry. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, I, I'll answer, Jeff, if I may. Uh, there are some people very hard of hearing. I am. I wear hearing aids. Now, I'm just wondering, very, sorry. very genuinely, <laughs> halakhically, to be an echo, there's a delay. So you hear an echo in a cave, you go echo, and it goes echo. Yeah. Whereas to put a sort of wider um, trumpet shape at the end of a chauffeur, in my mind, is not an echo because there's no delay. 
Okay, so I will tell you what I think, but I don't. But but uh, but I'll have to. I will do that as a homework and find out. Thank you. Um, what I think is, and I, but I very much could be wrong. That even in, that exactly what you said. It's there has to be the sound and there has to be the time delay. It's, it's a halakhic question. Yeah, yeah, the time delay probably exists also in that horn shape that you said. It's just we don't see the time. We don't hear the time delay. It's so quick, but there is a time delay. Could be. You're not hearing the sound directly from the shofar. You're hearing it a very minuscule time, time delay. The time it takes for sound to travel in that horn to bounce off the walls. So whatever time delay it is, it is there. That's what makes an echo, as you said. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. But I'm going to ask the Shiloh and find out. Sorry, David. Could you just repeat the question? <laughs> that can, which, yeah. end, which end? That end? Very good. We've got to it's shoot it to test it. <laughs> Amazing, Jeff. Amazing. I remember when on the Shabbos afternoons, by the Rebbe's for Brengans, there was a, a yeah. Jew who would sit behind the Rebbe, and on Shabbos, he didn't wear his electric hearing aid. He wouldn't wear it on Shabbos. So he had a horn, something like that, but much smaller. And he had that in his ear, and he used to sit like that and listen instead of his hearing aid. He had an old-fashioned hearing aid, which was that type of horn. So he, was hearing, he was hearing an echo by your definition. Yeah, well, that's fine. He's, he wanted to hear what the Rebbe was saying. There's no halacha if you hear yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's an interesting and a genuine halachic Yeah, question. it's a very good question. I'm going to get it. I'm going to find that out. Yeah. I would say it's an amplification rather than a delayed sound. Okay. But I don't know. Okay. Okay, so now, a half-slave. It means that someone who's owned two partners own a slave. One freed him, one didn't. So he's half a slave. A tumtum and an andreginus. These are medical terms. Tumtum is someone who we don't know, male or female, because the genitalia is, is covered over by skin. And andreginus is someone who has both male and female genitalia. So these three types of people are obligated to hear the shoifer. Okay? Because the half of him that's not a slave is obligated. So he has to hear the shoifer. The tumtum could be a male or a female. We don't know. He has to hear if he's a male. The andreginus certainly is, is a male, so he has to hear the shoifer as well. <laughs> Another important rule, and this applies to Schaefer and to many other things now. Whoever is not himself obligated regarding this mitzvah cannot facilitate the performance of the mitzvah for someone who is obligated. What we know it in our terminology is yetzazayim, to be mitzvah somebody else. Like, for example, when you make kiddush on Shabbos, does everybody around your table make kiddush? Or do you make kiddush and your yetzah, everyone else, they hear from your kiddush, their yetzah from your kiddush? Let's take a survey. Do you make everyone make <laughs> Kiddush or do you make for everyone? You make for everyone. Oh. I make for everyone, yeah. And they are Yetzir. Yetzir means they fulfill their obligation of hearing Kiddush from you. Right? You have then the Lecha Mishnah, the two breads. They are Yetzir, their obligation from you. And that's what he's talking about over here. Whoever himself, and this is a general rule, not just for Shoifer, whoever is not obligated regarding a mitzvah, this, he says this matter, Cannot be Yetzir facilitate the performance of mitzvah for someone else. So someone who's not obligated in Kiddush cannot say Kiddush for someone else. For so thus, for so woman, huh? thus, if a woman or a minor blows the shofar, the one who heard it has not fulfilled his obligation because a woman and a minor are not obligated to hear the shofar. Yes, the common practice today is that women hear the shofar as well. But if someone is blowing shofar for the women and there's no men present, then he shouldn't say the bracha. He should find one of the women to make the bracha. Because when I'm blowing shofar for others, I can say the bracha, and I can, because I'm being mighty then. But if I'm blowing it for the women, they're not obligated anyway. So I can't say the bracha. So they have to make their own bracha. But if a woman blows for other women, she can do that. She can't blow for men. You get it? Very straightforward. Okay. Number three. A person who's half slave and half free cannot even facilitate the performance of the mitzvah for himself. Okay, he goes into these type of things. We don't, we don't have time for everything. Um, what about someone who's practicing? On Rosh Hashanah, a person who occupies himself with blowing the shofar in order to learn. He woke up in the morning, whatever the scenario is, the regular shul shofar blower is not available. He's not well. So 
the caretaker from Shul came running over to the president's house and says, we need someone to blow the shofar. So the president says, well, let me have a go. Let me try. So he's at home and he's trying to blow. He has the machzah open in front of him and he tries to do the notes. And he does quite well. Has he fulfilled his obligation for that day to blow the shofar or not? He didn't say a bracha, but you don't need a bracha. The bracha is because it's a mitzvah, but if you blew it without a bracha, you still fulfill the mitzvah. The bracha is the rabbinic. Have he, has he fulfilled his biblical obligation when he was doing it to practice? So the din is, says the Rambam, does the, he has not fulfilled his obligation. He heard all the notes. He blew them all. His, in the next room, someone heard it. If it is only for practice, not. Similarly, one who hears the shefer from a person who blows it casually does not fulfill his obligation. Um, who is the casually over here? The blower or the listener? Seems to ah. be the blower. It means someone who hears it, but I just told you. Someone who hears it from the person who's practicing. That's what it means. If the person hearing had the intention of fulfilling his obligation, but the person blowing did not have the intention of facilitating the latter's performance of the mitzvah, I hear him blowing shoifer, but he didn't have me in mind. Or the person blowing had the intention of facilitating his colleague's performance of the mitzvah, but the person hearing it did not have the intention of fulfilling the mitzvah. Does it require both of us to have the kavana, the intention? And the din is that the person hearing it has not fulfilled his obligation. It has to be both the blower and the listener. If to both be focused, that we're now going to fulfill the mitzvah of blowing shofar. So if I'm walking by shul and I hear them, I'm on my way as back in the olden days. I'm going to Greenbank because it's further and I don't go to the shul that's near my house. So I'm not going to go to Childwell. Now I'm going to walk by Childwell and go to Greenbank. But they happen to be blowing the shofar there. So I stop and listen to the shofar. Have I fulfilled my obligation? No. Because the one blowing the shofar in Childwell is only knows about the people inside. He's never thought that there's someone outside listening. So he's not fulfilled obligation for me. That's what he's saying over here. Both have to be involved. Um, so this is, again, has practical relevance. Um, for example blowing blowing outside you're blowing for somebody and then you see another jew did you hear the shaifa yet yeah i just actually heard you i was around the corner no no you got to hear it again you haven't fulfilled your obligation number five if a person blew the shaifa with the intention of enabling all those hearing his blowing to perform the mitzvah i don't have any anyone in mind anyone who wants to who wants to fulfill i have you in mind and a listener heard while having the intention of fulfilling the obligation. In other words, back to the example of the fellow who's outside the shul. Even though the person blowing did not have a specific intention that this individual would hear his blowing, nor did he know even know about him, the listener has fulfilled his obligation. Why? Because the blower had in mind all those who heard him. Which is an interesting thing. And this applies to other myths as well. I'm making kiddish. I can either make kiddish and I'm specifically focused on the people around my table. But somebody was in the other room, he has to make his own Kiddush again. I didn't have him in mind. Or I can say, I'm, I'm making Kiddush for everyone. Those who I see, those who I don't see, those who are behind me. It's a big room, there's lots of people. I'm making Kiddush for everyone. Like, like someone who makes Kiddush in shul, um, you know, and there's so many people. You don't have to remember everybody that's there. As long as he had in mind that it's for everyone, everyone fulfills the obligation. Same with Shai for him. Accordingly, if a person was traveling on a journey or was sitting in his home, and heard the tkiyas from the person leading the congregation, he has fulfilled his obligation if he had that intention. Since the leader of the congregation had the intention of enabling the man to fulfill, the many to fulfill their obligation. I have a big problem over here. What's the problem here? I have a big question over here. Do you see what my question is? Let's see what this one says. What do you mean he was journey? What is traveling on a journey? That's Yom Tiv. Where's he going? <laughs> so he brings over here, the Mogan Avram explains that a person who continues, let me move this, the person who continues traveling must be sure that he has the intention of fulfilling his obligation. However, if he stops to hear the shofar, that itself is sufficient proof that his desire is to fulfill the mitzvah. I don't know, he doesn't answer the question here. Why is a person traveling on Yom Tiv? Is it allowed to travel on Yom Tiv? I don't know. Okay, I got to figure that out for homework. You understand my problem? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Here comes this year's Shaila. If Yom Tiv of Rosh Hashanah falls on Shabbos, so the shofar is not sounded in every place. In other words, everywhere. 
this was, it's a biblical mitzvah, but this law was enacted even though blowing the shofar was forbidden only as a shavus. It's a rabbinic thing not to blow. But why was it enacted? Because the says because they, oh, we didn't got, that's right we're concerned about someone carrying it yeah <laughs> David Orland still has an outstanding question I haven't answered him yet I know <laughs> it would be appropriate for the shofar to be sounded because a positive commander of the Torah should supersede a shvus instituted by the sages so why is it not sounded because we're concerned about somebody carrying what's going on oh I'm sorry it's a different shvus over here let me get the original here. What's he saying? Ah, the shvus over here. Remember, shvus is a rabbinic enactment. Yeah, the shvus over here is that perhaps he's going to fix the uh, the musical instrument. So they said you may again. They don't have sophisticated shofars like we have today. Why are we not allowed to play music on Shabbos? Because you may come to repair or fix the musical instrument, which would involve a biblical prohibition. So that's a shvus. Same thing is over here. So that's why they said you don't blow. So the question the Rabbi says is, how can a shvus override a biblical mitzvah? Why is the shefer not sounded? And the answer is because of the decree of the sages, lest a person take it into his hands and carry it to, to a colleague, so that the ladder can blow for him. You know that you're going to take it out to somebody. And in the process, carry it four cubits in the public domain or transfer it from one domain to another and thus violate the permission punishable by being stoned to death. The biblical permission of carrying on Shabbos, which we discussed at length last week. Okay, this is necessary because all are obligated in the midst of blowing, but not all are skilled in it or the midst of hearing. Okay? Again, he says, they see again, it's the translation. All are obligated in the mitzvah of, look at the Hebrew here, shakol chayavim batkia, not to blow, the blowing, you know, it's to hear the blowing, not to blow. Okay. What about children? Children have not reached the age at which they can be educated. They're very young. We need not prevent them from blowing the shayfar on the Shabbos, which is not the festival of Rosh Hashanah, so that they will learn to blow. So, so they're allowed to blow, even though they're not allowed to blow a shofar on Shabbos, a regular Shabbos, any Shabbos. Children, it's okay. It's training for them. An adult is even permitted to be involved in the instruction of children in the blowing of the shofar on Yom Tov. This applies concerning both children who have reached an age which they can be educated and those who have not reached that age, which is usually about the, what is the age of five, six. Because the blowing the shofar is, only, is prohibited only as a shavos. Okay, so therefore we can be lenient for children who are learning how to blow. When they decree that the Shavu should not be blown on Shabbos, they only apply the decree to places where there was no court. However, while the base of Mikdash was standing in the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court was seated in Jerusalem, everyone would sound the Shavu only in the city of Jerusalem. Throughout the entire period, the court held its sessions there. And this is not applied to the people of Jerusalem alone, rather, every city that was within the outer limits of Jerusalem and whose inhabitants could see Jerusalem, excluding those within a wadi, or they could hear the shofar blown in Jerusalem, excluding those on the mountaintops because it's probably an echo, and though excluding those who can travel to Jerusalem, sorry, who could travel to Jerusalem, excluding those who are separated by wadi from the city. You have the similar di- law to compare it with is in the laws of Purim. That uh, cities, walled cities, remember? Walled cities have Purim the next day. Shushan Purim. So Jerusalem is a walled city. Not the walls of today. It was always a walled city. So Jerusalem has Purim the next day. But um, who else? Anyone who's in, in, near enough to be able to see Jerusalem also has has Purim the next day. That's this first one here. So the people, so they were, so so the prohibition of the ban of blowing Shafer did not apply to them because there was a Sanhedrin, so they were keeping an eye on things that everything should be okay. So it's anybody in Jerusalem and the environs of Jerusalem. The people of these cities would blow the Shafer on Shabbos as in Jerusalem. However, in the other cities of Israel, they would not sound the Shafer on Shabbos for the reasons we said earlier. So what do we do today? Practically, says the Rambam. 
At present, while the temple is destroyed, wherever a court whose judges received smicha in the land of Israel, wherever such a court permanently holds sessions, the shofar is sounded on Shabbos. Furthermore, the shofar is sounded on Shabbos only in a court that has sanctified the new moon. But in other places, the shofar will not be sounded in other courts, even though the judges have received smicha, although the shofar is sounded only in the presence of a high court. So therefore, we no longer blow the shofar because we no longer have people who have their smicha from as it was then, and we don't also sanctify the new moon anymore. So we don't blow shofar on Shabbos anywhere, even in Jerusalem today. Um, right, okay, why is it allowed? Because of the courts? So he says what I told you earlier, because the court is scrupulous in the observance of the mitzvahs, and in its presence, those who blow the shofar will not carry the shofar in the public domain, for the court will warn the people and inform them. Okay, in the present age, when we celebrate Rosh Hashanah in the exile, for two days, we didn't discuss yet. Why do we celebrate Rosh Hashanah for two days? Even in Israel, they celebrate Rosh Hashanah for two days. Anybody know? Anybody can guess? David Oden, you should know. Good evening, Ian. So, David, we learned. In the times when they, when, they, when they established the new month by sight, so witnesses had to come. Now, the Sanhedrin already knew the astronomical calculations. They knew that today, that today would have been the new moon. So now, today is the 29th day. Today is day 30, sorry, from the last moon. So today must be the new moon. This is under any month. So if witnesses come today before sunset, so they, in the Beis Hamikdash, they'll bring a carbon musaf, and they'll pronounce today as day one of the next month. Not day 30 anymore. If no witnesses come, well then tonight is already day one of the, there's no 31 days in this lunar month, right? So then tomorrow is day one. So that's all very nice. But when it comes to Rosh Hashanah, Today was 29. Yesterday was 29. Today is day 30. If witnesses come, then today is actually Rosh Hashanah. We'll find out an hour before sunset. Or if they don't come, then tomorrow is Rosh Hashanah. So they, because of this suffering, because of this doubt, we don't know. So therefore, they had two days of Rosh Hashanah, even in Israel, and that carries on till this very day. You understood that? Okay. Ten, in the present age, when we celebrate Rosh Hashanah in exile for two days, the shofar sounded on the second day exactly as we do it sound on the first day. The same mitzvah, the same everything. With all the details that we said earlier. If the first day falls on Shabbos, like this year, though, like next year, sorry, those who are not in the presence of a court fit to blow the shofar on Shabbos may blow the shofar on the second day alone, which is on Sunday, as we will be doing this year. Okay. How should we blow? How much should we done? So we've done what's a kosher shofar. We've done who's obligated. And now chapter three, how to actually blow. What's the formula? Because as I pointed out to you at the beginning, all we have is a verse that says, Yom Trua, a day of sounding or a day of blowing. It doesn't say what to blow. So we know there has to be a tkiah before and a tkiah after. We said that earlier. How many shofar blasts is a person required to hear on Rosh Hashanah? See again, how much to hear? Because the mitzvah is hearing. The answer is minimum is nine. How do we work out nine? The Torah mentions the word trua three times in association with Rosh Hashanah and Yovel. Now, as we've established earlier, every trua needs to be pre preceded and followed by a single long blast. According to the oral tradition that Moses brought from Mount Sinai from God, we learn that whether on Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur or the, of the Yovel, of the Yovel, all the signs of the Shefer of the seventh month are a single entity. So nine blasts must be sounded on both of them. Tkia, trua, tkia. Tria, tkia, trua, tkia, tkia, trua, tkia. Because it's mentioned three times. And we know that there's a tkia before and after. So whether it's the blowing of Rosh or the blowing of the Yevil, it's done nine. Okay. But what's the trua? We still haven't identified what it is. Over the passage of years and throughout many exiles, doubt has been raised concerning the Torah of which the Torah mentions. 
to the extent that we do not know what it is. We no longer know what the trua is. We know there's a tkia before and a tkia after. We know what a tkia is. It's a long sound. But what's a trua? Does it resemble the wailing with which the women cry when they moan? Or the sigh of a person who is distressed about a major matter will release repeatedly? What is a krechts? Oi. Oi. Or one is um, a cry, you know, <laughs> that type of thing, as we know. Perhaps it's a combination of the two, sighing and crying. And crying. Perhaps that's called a trua, because a distressed person will sigh and then cry. So therefore, we fulfill all of these possibilities. So we need to do three times of each. What's three times of each? Three times tkia and shvarim trua and then tkia, three times, because it could be both. And then three times of each one alone. Hence, we end up with the 30 that we're familiar with. Right? Okay. Okay. So here he elaborates now. The crying refers to what we call trua. The repeated sighs refers to what we call shvarim. Thus, even though we do we do blow shvarim before trua, for some reason the Ramam is mentioning trua first. Thus, the order of blowing the shvarim is as follows: first one recites the blessing and sounds a tkia, afterwards three shvarim, then afterwards a trua, and afterwards a tkia, and he repeats this pattern three times. The, three, we already explained why. Because it's mentioned three, and perhaps it's mentioned three times in the verse. Then he sounds a tkia, and then a sh- three shvarim, and afterwards a tkia, and repeats this pattern three times. Then he sounds a tkia, and then a trua, and afterwards a tkia again three times. Thus, there are a total of thirty shayfer blasts in order to remove any doubt. Okay, so we started off the basic is nine, but we don't know what the nine should be, so it ends up as thirty. Did I go through that too quick? You understand that? Everyone's quiet. Okay. Vivian's laughing. What are you laughing? <laughs> Say something. Argue. Epis, huh? Number four. So, now we know what has to be done. How do we do them? Is there a shear? Is there a measurement of how long they have to be? The required length of a trua is two tkias. The required length of the three shvarim is that of a trua. So, three shvarim is one trua, which is two tkis. That's the formula. X times Y times Z equals, yeah? When a person sounds a tki and a trua, and afterwards, so in other words, what does that mean? How long does it have to be? It means that the person who's blowing has to know that however long he's going to blow his tkia, that's how long his shvarim and trua should be. So if his tkia, let's say, is four seconds, so the trua, um, the trua has to be eight seconds. You get it? And the, and the length of the three shvarim is eight seconds too. The length of the trua. You understand? It's not just someone gets up there. Some people unfortunately do. You can't just get up there and blow the shofar. They have to be uniform. Okay? When a person sounds a tkia and a trua and afterwards sounds a long tkia, extending it twice the length of the original one, we do not say that it may be considered to be two tkias and then in the next, you know, for the next line, thus allowing one to complete the series merely by sounding a trua and another tkia. Rather, if one extended the tkia the entire day, if that's in theory, right? You can blow a shafer for a whole day. But if you can, could, it's considered to be only a single tkia. And then for the next line, you got to sound another tkia, trua, and tkia until he completes this three series. Okay, so the tkia that you start off the line with has to, the, the shvarim and the trua has to be as long as that. The tkia at the end has to be at least as long as that. But even if you do it very, very long, it's still considered as one tkia. That's why it's important that the shofar blower should know and be familiar with the laws of Loeg Shafer, as well as the Makri. The Makri is the one who points and calls out the, uh, in some communities like here, someone calls out the notes. So the notes, the one who's reading, who's calling notes, and the blower have to be familiar with the laws, so he should know, they should know if he has to go back if he made a mistake. 
sometimes the blower is involved in blowing and he's not able to, and the, and the, and the reader realizes that he made a mistake. So he has to point back to where he was. And the people might not know about it and they're wondering why he's gone back, why he's repeating it. That's where confusion starts. Number five, if a person hears one shofar blast at one hour and a second one an hour later. In other words, now and later, it doesn't mean 60 minutes. It means not at the same time. Even if he waits the entire day, the two may be considered to be a single unit and he fulfills his obligation. Again, a theoretical case. We only heard one blows now, and then you hear the other one later. The above applies provided each series is heard in the proper order, meaning one may not hear a trua and afterwards two tkiyas, or two tkiyas and afterwards the trua. No, it has to be tkiya, trua in middle. Right? The sound has to be with the tkiya before and after. If a person heard nine shofar blasts from nine men simultaneously, stereo sound, nine people are blowing. He's not fulfilled his obligation, even for one. If he heard the tkiya from one, and then a trua from another, and a tkiya from a third, in sequence, as we said earlier, that's fine. That's similar to hearing it an hour apart. It can be from different people. The above applies even if one heard the shofar blast with interruptions, even if the blowing was extended over the entire day. A person does not fulfill his obligation until he hears all nine shofar blasts. For they are all only one mitzvah. Thus, they are dependent one on the other. When he says all nine, what does he mean? What does it mean for us in practically? It means thirty, because we don't know what the nine are, because we don't know what the trua is. It could be the shvarim. It could be the what we call trua. It could be. Shavuot and Torah together, so it's 30. That's what he means when he says you have not fulfilled the obligation until you heard all nine. It could be the first nine, it could be the second nine, it could be the third nine. The congregation is obligated to hear the Shefer blast together in the order of the blessings. What does that mean? In Musaf, there is, in every Amida, we start off with the blessing of the Avot, right? Mogen Avraham. We speak about the patriarchs in every Amidah of the year, three times a day. Then we go to Atta Gibar. We speak about God's strength. And then Atta Kodesh, sanctification of God's name. And then Shabbos and Yom Tov, we go into other things. On Yom Tov, on, on Rosh Hashanah, we have a long bracha called Malchia, three long brachas. You might be familiar. In the, the, the main part, body of the Musaf of Rosh Hashanah is three long brachas. One that speaks about Malchia, God's kingdom. So then the shofar is sounded three times. Zichronot is memories, where the, we recite ten verses of Amalchias, ten verses of God remembering, starting from God remembered Noah. The shofar is sounded three times. And then we mentioned ten verses of Tanakh that speak about shofar. And then it's also sounded three times. And then we go to Avoida, which is the Ritzei, an acknowledgement of God's wonders, which is made him. And then Birchas Kainim, which we know at the end of the repetition of the Amidah, there's Birchas Kainim. That is the order in which one fulfills the mitzvah. So we have, shef, in practical terms today, we have it 30 in one shot after laning. Then we have another 30 in the Musaf as well. In, some, in the repetition. In some communities, they actually have the other 30 um, in the silent Amidah too. Okay. Um... Okay, they're going to skip eight. I want you not to recite verse. Okay, then, uh, okay, that's already laws already of the davening, not of the shofar. Okay, here goes. Here's the commonly accepted custom for blowing the shofar Rosh Hashanah in the community. After, in other words, if you have a shul, you're davening a minion. After the Torah is read and returned to its place, the congregation is seated. Today we don't return the sefer Torah, rather the sefer Torah is there with the shofar. It's returned afterwards. And these are known as tkiyas de miyushav. They may be seated. We all stand today, but you may be seated. We need to. While the other tkiyas, the other blowing is in the Musaf, in the Amidah, so we're standing. So these are known as the seated ones. So someone says, the bracha shakachadu is in lishma to hear the sound of the shofar. Everyone says, Amen. Then he says, shechiyanu. And everybody says, Amen. And the 30 blasts that we described earlier are blown, and then Kaddish and Musaf. Okay. And he goes through the process of how we blow during Musaf. Um, the person who sounds the shofar, the sitting ones, also sounds the shofar according to the order of the blessings while they stand. In other words, the one who blew the first 30 after, after laning blows the Musaf ones as well. Again, the Allah does not follow the Rambam, and it could be two different people as well, if, if necessary. Here's an important one. You should not speak between the shofar blasts while the congregation is seated or those while they stand. 
if he did talk between them, even though it's wrong, he does not repeat the blessings. Why is he not allowed to talk? Because he said a bracha, and the mitzvah isn't properly over until the other blasts are blown as well. So you can't interrupt. Um, right, okay. What time have we got here? Right, okay, so let, let's see. Um, oh, that's what I said to you earlier. The brachas are not dependent on the tkiyas, and the tkiyas are not dependent on the brachas. Meaning, if you didn't say a bracha, oi, I forgot to say a bracha, you don't have to blow shayfar again. Okay. Um, one second. Okay, yeah, that's the end of that one. Oh, what does it mean that the, the brachas are not dependent on the tkiyas? If it is impossible for a person to hear the shayfar blown, he should still attend, attempt, attempt to recite or hear the blessings at least, if he can't hear the shayfar. Strange scenario. You can hear the brachas, but he can't hear the shayfar. I don't know. But that's uh, what the Rambam says. Okay. Then, okay, that's the, an overview from the Rambam of all of the laws of the shayfar, who's obligated, when we're obligated, how the obligation is performed, any questions on what we've just done. Oh, you're quite right about the echo. I looked it up, and it is an echo in a trumpet. So, well done. Spot on. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. If there's no other question, there's one other matter that I came that I found today. I made a note of it from last year, and I don't know if I'll remember till next week. An interesting thing. Old dip an apple in honey. It's a custom, right? What type of apple do you use? One off a tree in the garden. Sorry? One off a tree in the garden. One off the tree in the garden. <laughs> Anyone know? Is there a preference to what type of apple we should use? Preferably a sweet one. Oh, why do you say a sweet one? Because it's going to be pleasurable to eat the apple with the honey. And if you have a one of those green sour ones, you're going to go, ooh. Okay. So the Shulchan Aruch actually says that we... <laughs> The custom is to dip an apple in honey, but the Shulchan Aruch says a sweet apple. Tapuach matok. And, uh-huh. Okay? And it's the Shulchan Aruch for the Svardim, the Ramah, and many others. They are specific to say an apple that's matok, that's sweet. Is there any particular type of honey? We, we've just uh, put them here. Hold on. We'll get to the honey in a minute. Let me tell you first about the apple. The apple is already a, as a halachic thing. So I'll send this to you on WhatsApp. This is a chart. I downloaded it from online. And it starts off with the most tart apples down to the sweetest apples. And therefore, the sweetest apple is the Fuji apple. That would be the ideal apple for dipping in honey. And then you work your way downwards, but certainly not a Granny Smith or a Pink Lady or a Brayburn. So I will send you this chart. I'll, it's a, I'll, I'll forward it soon on the WhatsApp. But it's, it's something that I discovered last year. And then I found this online. There's different sweetnesses. And it starts from most sweet all the way up to very tart. And to fulfill this custom properly, it has to be a sweet apple. So I would imagine it has to be from the lower half of this chart. Uh, I'll go to Tesco and just buy the Fujis. Uh, best is the Fuji, yeah. Um, as far as David's question about the honey, No. All honey is sweet, so there's no problem with that. Um, So there's no preference for any particular type of honey. Okay? Um, Kosher honey? Sorry? Kosher honey? So I was about to say, honey is naturally kosher, right? The big riddles they gave us as kids, if a bee is not kosher, why is a honey kosher? Because the bee doesn't produce the honey, it only transports the pollen and then it develops it, but it's not a product of the bee. Right, so that's why it's kosher. It's a natural product. It's not a product of the creature. Um, but today they process the honey. That's where the problems come in. It's things which on their own are innocent, but once they go through factories, they could have problems. That's why you have kosher honey, because if they go through factories, sometimes the factories are processing milk, milky things. So it could be milchiks. You see, the factories don't. They may sterilize their machinery, but they don't kosherize the machinery. So machinery can become milchik or fleshik, and then they process it, it becomes milchik or fleshik. Okay, that's why 
if we can, we should use honey that has a hechsha on it, then we know for sure that uh, that it's okay. There are, if you go to the London Besden here in this country, you go to the London Besden website, they have a search engine where if you, you happen to find the honey and it doesn't have a status, it doesn't say kosher, you can look in, they may have looked into it and said that it's approved. Right? And so generally, honey is fine as long as it's not doesn't have anything else in it that could make it not kosher. Okay. Any other questions before we go to the video? No? Okay, then. I think, think I've solved the problem that we had with the video all these weeks. So, share screen, and it will hopefully work. Where are we going here? Here we go. Share screen. Here we go. Can you see it now? Yes. Yes. What does it say? Press the skip. <laughs> That's my school. I had a radio program from the yeshiva. And I usually spoke Chassid Shein Yonam. And Baruch Hashem, it made a, a, a very good, good impression. So I, came, I went into the Rebbe and I suggested, why not making a Shia Tanya on the radio? And the Rebbe said, the time hasn't come yet. This was Tov Shein Yotes. <laughs> Tovshin Chov, the year of the Baal Shem Tov, I decided I'll send in to the Rebbe a sample. As soon as I send in a sample of Shia, the Rebbe sent out a hundred dollars for the exp part of the expenses, and the Rebbe agreed to the Shia. Antikir Yor is a 300 years in the Istalkut, he moved from Baal Shem It's 10.01. You tune to WEVD New York, 98 on the FM dial, the station that speaks your language. Shabbatov. I get a book of Libby Eden in honor from Vardla Hafotas Hasidus. The learner for Shia Sefatanio is a Avre Biosa Weinberg. They are good vacants in the Tihar. A Rav Weinberg. Good work, Hosheve Zuhere und Mitlerner von unser Shia. In dem Schablat von dem Tanya schreibt der alte Rebbe, Seifele Kutte Amorem Heiligrischen. The beginning to explain more, like Schwue. Right in the I had four pages on Shvuah, and the Rebbe made a, made a, an old four pages, and the Rebbe said, we'll mix up people that are beginners. The Rebbe gave direction to, for each and everything. Baruch Hashem, it went on a whole year, and gave the Rebbe a gewaltig and what <laughs> 
ושני כנגדי דוסי דבר הווי בימו ובירו וברסס ובזיו ודוס אותיס גהלטן דניסיינס ונשון ושלימו כי מבוי ברוך נכסידס אז דמיילף ונזך ושלטיס אדם ציור ודוס בווייס תעשי על שינויים וסידויים ולט ויטנית דפר וסט פר בינצח מתעיינים ודוס הנצחי דוס הנית ונטר וולף ומטבע The Rebbe's mother was a great admirer of my shiur on the Tanya on the radio. So when she passed away, I suggested to the Rebbe, since she was such an admirer of the shiurim, maybe we should add another 15 minutes on the radio to give over the Rebbe's sikhs from the Shabbos for bringing. But I don't know yet where I'll get the money for it. Because it was quite expensive. The Rebbe said, Mach Zeolai, have a take upon myself. The Shabbos in the Fabrengen, and the Rebbe Schlitter has explained to them that by every day it is there the Kuyach of the Mune and Messiah's Nefesh. Because all... It's very strange, and we see the words of Jesus in our lives. Even if it's going to the Matres, or the Matres of the Lord in the Lord, He debia be hakod v'korcho adar matches gil teichet tibet di spoilers. There was one time that the Rebbe didn't have time before Shabbos to be Magia. And I had to go in those days, I had to go around to the radio station in Manhattan. So I, I was standing and waiting, the Rebbe should send it out. So three and a half hours, the Rebbe had written a beer on the end of Perik Memtes. What the rabbi had put in, in this shiurim, is unbelievable. Unbelievable. The einzige shiur tiny is Frank Zachon, the Umfang from Perik Memtes. In the Frieden Perik Memtes. The whole cycle took from 22 years. And in those 22 years, the rabbi was Magia from the Shablat, from the, till the, till the very end. The shiur in Tani was Mahal Tister. In Messiah was an encounter with Sachri. ומ learn to say it in a nef madozol nispashet ven bechol katzvi tevo unin a nef from from regel kememre bigeret kamo pomim in the chashivus unin the miluy from them nef from limud datere bichlal un limud pnimis datere in welches vert for line be miuchod be derisei no elu darinim from a fotzes amayon eschutz. Baruch Hashem, and people were very pleased with it. Then somebody suggested to print a sefer. So I came in to the Rebbe. In the morning, Rabbi Groner calls me. The Rebbe says I should start immediately preparing for printing. Ve'en ve'inyon ifon dusho ve'tei v'zach e'in seifim he'in on v'hi rotsin ados al nochmet suhayim. Der Lernen Tere mit Piv shal Mashiach zitkeinu, der Rossi shal Mashiach, war Kizu verano no Sheikh Nehofa, und der alte Rebbe und Nessie im Malen bekäme bis Nessie der Reino, der Rebbe der Schwer betechel. Baruch Hashem, now they have in seven languages, from Yiddish immediately in Hebrew, in English, and now in Spanish, in Portuguese, French, And the Rebbe was in this, the Rebbe gave so much time, so much time, because he, he knew what's going to come out from it, Baruch Hashem. der Reino hat erzählt, aber schade, dass er nach Zedeki geboren geworden ist, wie der Mond früher. Er, der Reisha Schona, von dem Jahr Tov Kuf Memtes, von dem hat der alte Rebbe gesagt, bis er ein Mercedes, ein Mann Mercedes, und dann noch hat das geworden, die ersten drei Brocken von Sefer Atani. Und Stani hebt sich davon mit Maschbine, es ist ein Zedek, ein jüdischer Neshoma, 
Eles e Geita Reis e Navil Hoelo, Ismash B, Nese Tehei Sadi, Kunizain de Heiper de Fum. O doce Zak Benegei su Yeder Erev Reisha Shono, o Benegei su Yeder In. Venes Gerwende la Yipar Bapar Nishmas Hai. Anishome von Odom Arishen, o doce Gewen Bereisha Shono. Und als er sich mit mir die Schöne beschöne, ich dämmelte die Heilodes, haben die Schöne ist, durch und durch, was wir beschaffen von der Snei, wie sie gewähnt, die paar Mal ist schön, in der Schöne herrschen, in der Mäschen, in der Schöne, 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 was alle in der Schöne ist, ist so, sein in Kolo. In Nishmas Yanke wie der Mond Frie, wo Schufre de Yanke, mein Schufre dort am Arischen, wo dort ist die Gewinn, Kolo, Kolo an Schomis. Sagt mir nun, als gleich mach bin ich sie, mit dem Zermachzedek oder noch mit Weil gewinn, dem Minion in Tanje, am Mach bin ich sie heute alle drei Pirushen. Deiser Pfaffen Pirush mach bin ich sie von Loschen Schwur. איך את משבי נעשה פונלושן שיבה, או משבי נעשה פונלושן סביאו מזתק תם אונדר מיט, ואל מבייל ברוך אין דה דרושים אין דה הגויס אין האורס פונצה מחצדק, אף תניה ושנכת גדרוקת ביזבסי בפשטוס, המזוקת אין פימיס הטרה, ואז נסגל סו בדרינו אוני אין דה פונצה מפונמלת נרב in Teres Achsidus. Amash Bine ist so nechet, als in Drufi dort de alle drei Sachen, als zu allem in der Baschwert mene, und der Ewigster besser wär, als Buchukese te Leche, im Buchukese te Leche, was mit Sweise te Schmero, was ist ein Meister mit dem Gemorren Befehlisch, ein im Erler Loschen Tachnunin, der Ewigster besser wär, und Baschwert wär, als so sein te Hiz Sadi, Und dann noch geht er ihm auf den Ruf, kehre ich in alle seine Schiebe in Joni, wo seine Kohle nicht schäfer mit ist, wo es in der Ruf besteht, der Riecher auf jedes Ordnung, die mir wohl bekam, und ich gehe mich sicher in die Ahores. Und ich geht ihm den Kehre in der Nähe von Maschbien, und ich sehe, ich lasse uns selber, mit sättigten Mann in Kehres Milamailo, er soll können durchführen. Die alle in Jonen Bilder mal sehr dachten, schön dachten, le Matre Himeno, und noch mehr der Unsättigen der Mähler. Aber der Elam soll sein, nicht nur al Milui in Nivra, wie sie gewähnt, zum ersten Mal nur al Milui, und noch mehr, wie sie wird sein, bei Elo Teil des Perets. Und da ist der Kirchen verbunden, wo Teil des Abal Schemter war, bei Herrscher Bachedisch Aschwi, Aschwi, wer sagt dem Medische, dass man Loschen Seva und von Loschen Schwi gibt Schüte und nachher wird er der Baal Shem der Teichter so, als er es allein sagt und sagt, ich tun dem ganz alle Gedoschen von Yachrise, die mir wohl Baruch in der Tero, wo das ist ich jetzt nicht lal in den drei Plocken von Tanja, auf Kolponi von dort kommen, dass ich jetzt alles nehmen, a jeder Ried und alle Ried, was er in Reisha Shona ist, er der Achone zu Reisha Shona. Wo der Mutter sehr an jedem Tchilles Maaseche, der Fahrer sich gewöhnt bei Yipar Bapar Nishmas Chayim, und da sehe ich, wenn jeder Ried wird geboren ein jüdisch Kind, in der Sein der Reisha Shona bei Yipar Bapar Nishmas Chayim. Und in der Ruhe geht mir mit dem Maschbi, mit den alle drei Teichen, ומון ילך לבטר דרכי בחיים, אך מצליח זין, אם אמר לזין דשניחו זין, ולשמש אסקייני, ולסס ליז בורך דילה בתחתיני. אוקיי.